Thank you very much. My name is Adetoye from University of Alberta. My question is for Barbara. So I want to ask about the voucher. Is there any limitation on the fixed feedstock for the voucher production? That's the first question. And the second question is this. I read something that voucher on, voucher on itself can be used for bioremediation process. So in your research, what's the contribution of voucher? If, for example, without using the plant, can we use voucher alone? And what's the contribution of that to the bioremediation? Thank you. Yeah, those are some really great questions. Um, for the first part of your question, biochar can be um, made from just about any feedstock, so any clean organic material. People have used um, biofuels, um, people use uh, wood, uh, coconut husks, uh, e all kinds of things. And again, it's really, really important to characterize the biochar. Some biochar will have a very large um, uh, specific surface area, and that will allow it to absorb a lot of contaminants very tightly. Other biochar will have a really good cation exchange capacity. That means it's able to absorb certain cations and assist with um, nutrient cycling. And that, in turn, sort of goes with your second part of your question, which is, yes, you can add biochar to soils, and the biochar will do different things depending on what kind of biochar. We kind of are now talking about designer biochars, because again, the characterization is so important. If I want to use a biochar to absorb um, contaminants, I'll make it in a specific way. I've done this to absorb um, PCBs, uh, uh, um, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, an industrial chemical. But if I want to use biochar that's going to help me break down petroleum hydrocarbons, I make it in a slightly different way. And then, yes, it will assist with the degradation because it will often um, attract more microorganisms. However, the plant roots really do assist with speeding up this process. Good. Uh, another question there on the right. Also for Barbara, uh, follow up on this one. Do you have a plant can have a specific uh, selectivity? Like uh, for particular metals or particular organic compound, do you have like a table of lists for what plant is good for what? Uh, I actually have industry people want to get rid of uh, certain uh, yeah. heavy metals. Do you have any comments? Um, yes, I, I, we absolutely do. So when we're looking um, at heavy metals in particular, we have some plants that work very well with things like nickel, um, cadmium, arsenic. Um, and yes, we, we are very particular about the types of plants that we select. A lot of research has been done on these um, hyperaccumulators or hyperextractors. And there's some very good literature out there on that. Again, it's very important to, go, to be site specific though. So we spend, my team spends a lot of time going to the site and looking at what's native to that area because we don't want to introduce other plants. And uh, so for example, there's a particular fern that can extract arsenic extremely well, but it's, it only grows in the southern US and in, in parts of China. Um, so we, we can't work with that. Uh, where I'm in, in Canada and up north at a lot of the, the sites where I work. So it's very specific to the area, but we definitely have plants. I work with um, cucurbits, so I have very specific subspecies of pumpkins and zucchini, and they actually accumulate lots of uh, PCBs and DDT. So depending on what the contaminant is, what, where the area is, and what the sort of um, site specifics in terms of um, soil type, um, uh, climate, etc. We, we are very particular in the plant species we select. And one question here. My name is Christoph Danuma from AITF. Uh, my question is addressed to Barbara. Uh, you started with uh, contaminated soil mm -hmm. and then you use plant for remediation. Yes. And uh, once you do that, I guess the plant becomes contaminated too. What do you do with the plant? And then uh, have you tried to compare, for example, some chemical used for remediation like uh, surfactant or microorganism? And then uh, which one do you think is more efficient? Or have you tried some combination of them? Thank you. 
Yep. In case you're wondering, we're just Barbara's backup singers. <laughs> <laughs> All together now. Okay. Yeah. Th those are some really great questions, and I love them. So, again, remember, today I was talking petroleum hydrocarbons, and I said we were working with rhizodegradation or rhizoremediation. That's kind of the most desirable mechanism because it actually breaks down those contaminants. When we're doing things with metals, metals don't break down any further. Metals are metals. And even things like um, PCBs, the industrial chemical, DDT, and other pesticides, they don't break down very well in the soil. So we use a different mechanism. We use the extraction mechanism. In this case, the plants are moving, they're taking the contaminant from the soil matrix into the roots and translocating it to the shoots. What we do, sometimes we do add surfactants to the soil and it, it speeds up the process. Um, and, and, and that works really well. But we have to harvest that material now. So what we do is we harvest it. And we, we do a lot of calculations and a lot of trials to figure out the best time to harvest. We harvest it. And in, what we have found is really good is to compost it. And we can compost it in a matter of about, depends on, on what it is, switch grass composts more slowly, depends on what it is, but we can compost it within about 90, 120 days. It takes a little bit of effort. And we've calculated that we can get that down to about 10% um, uh, of the volume. So it's a volume reduction technology. So if you think of something, say the size of a football field, and you plant it, and it's contaminated with metals, and you plant it over a number of seasons, and you keep extracting, and you have to keep harvesting and composting, then at the end of the time, which is usually within about a decade, you've got this volume that's been significantly reduced. So maybe a couple of barrels of highly contaminated, highly concentrated uh, material now that still needs to go to a hazardous waste landfill or to an incineration facility or whatever. But you're leaving the soil matrix intact, and so you're not losing that very important resource. The second part of your question, we've done some life cycle analysis to sort of figure out what's, what's going to be best. And indeed, any time you're able to leave um, the soil intact, things are, are generally good. But where, where this really pays off is when you have a contaminated site that's a larger site with lower amounts of contamination. Because it is very difficult for plants to very quickly take up or very quickly degrade extremely high concentrations. So there is a bit of a trade-off. And the one thing I didn't tell you about phytotechnologies is, yes, of course, they do tend to be a little bit slower than the traditional dig and treat. We can never keep up with that. But when you think about some of these tremendous amounts of pollution that have been put down over many, many decades, if we can clean it up within you know, seven to nine, maybe 10 years, we're still uh, pretty far ahead. And I think we have time maybe for one more question before the break. And there is somebody, of, there's somebody there. And, and don't forget, if you want to address a question to any of the three at <laughs> coffee, because we're going to force them to come out for coffee, um, that'll be fine too. So, yeah. Hi, Scott Lundy from Alberta Innovates Technology Futures. My question is for Sherry. Sherry, um, I work uh, with uh, clients that range in forestry, agriculture, food, uh, as well as environment. But um, I'm thinking of the farmer who is uh, uh, faced with the decision as to which crop to, to raise or grow uh, and other alternate uses for the land. And I just wonder how in, a, uh, in an industry where farmers are always concerned with what is my cash crop and how can I make the most per acre? I wonder how you uh, and your project uh, are going to convince farmers to uh, c consider another way. So I don't have a, a mic, but can, you, can everyone hear me? What, you can go back to the podium. Okay. That's a, a really important question, and I think that the, the use of the reverse auction is the mechanism to help understand price really enables us to have conversations with the landowners about exactly what you're talking about. So thinking about opportunity costs and thinking about if I take that land that is now in production and I take it out of production and essentially now start farming wetlands, what do I want to receive as a, as a payment for that new crop? And so I think that is part of the conversation. I think we have to start looking at wetlands as sort of alternative not just alternative land use and, and 
things that are in the way on the landscape, but they're, they're there with the potential of becoming new crops and that we can start to farm ecosystem services. The crux of that is that people, we have markets to buy barley and we have markets for pulp and paper. We don't have markets for wetlands yet. And so the, the really ultimate, the big question is where does that money come from? If we're gonna pay people to farm ecosystem, ecosystem services, we need people who are willing to accept that payment, but we also need people who are willing to pay. And so that's, I mean, that's sort of the elephant in the room who's going to be willing to pay for these ecosystem services. And I think that conversation has to move into the realm of we all need to pay because we all, most of the benefits that accrue when you restore a wetland don't accrue directly to the landowner. They're, they're larger, larger scale impacts and larger scale benefits like climate moderation, for example. So we all benefit in this room for that wetland restoration and we have to be willing to pay for that. Great questions. Uh, we're going to take a break back. Coffee is back where it was originally in the Schachter Lounge. And uh, Steve will bring the cowbell. This is the only science meeting where the phrase more cowbell actually makes sense. Good work, everybody. Good, eh? <laughs>